All right, good afternoon. Uh, let's get started. Somehow my computer is really slow today. I think I need a reboot. Um, so uh, we just had an exam three, and that was about the beam def deformation, right? Um, then we cover like more circle. So, so far we have been talking about uh, different models. You have a cable model, right? When you have an axial load or bar, you know, axial load, how things deform. Then we talk about when you twist, have a torsion, right? Applying a torque, how things deform. And then we talk about long bar bending, lateral load, how will it bend, how much stress, how much uh, deformation, right? Okay, so that's a three basic type of uh, deformation, uh, the structure we talk about. A bar, a shaft, and a, a beam. Okay, so today we're going to cover the last format of structure uh, or the deformation. That is a uh, column. Okay, so what is a column? A column is basically a structure, all right, a long slender bar, a structure, or you can say it's a beam, right? And now the loading condition is different. The load is actual compression. So if this is like a column, I press on the top, and that we call it a column. So it's another type of model. So it's a bar model, axial tension, twist, shaft model, and then you have the bending, beam model. Now we talk about the column model. So it's just a different loading condition. And one thing special about the uh, column here is uh, the issue is slightly different. We'll look at more the stability of the column. Okay. Remember at the beginning of the uh, class, we talk about things can fail in different ways. One is, for example, you have applied too much load or too much stress. You can have uh, overloaded, so you can have uh, crack generated, right? So saying material can fail, fail because of overstress or overloading. That's one thing we commonly see, right? You tear a piece of paper or you knock on something too hard, they will make a dent and then they will make a hole. So that's all the failure because of overstress. Okay, that's one type of failure. Another one is, uh, we talk about the fatigue. You know, not much load, but you keep loading, unloading, loading, unloading, like you keep bending a metal wire, you can break it. Right? I don't know, anyone got the experience, break a metal wire by just bending it? No? Yes, right? We used to do that when, as a kid, because we don't have pliers that conveniently available. So you want to break a metal wire, just keep bending, bending, and then you break it. So that's a typical example of fatigue, uh, you know, over high frequency, uh, continuous loading and loading, uh, you can feel a material, right? And then we say also you can have uh, temperature or uh, environmental change. So things can, let's say, especially plastic, over time, can generate too much deformation. So we can say it's creep or relaxation that causing failure. Right? And the first is what we call instability. Okay. So it's buckling here. Right? So buckling is a type of instability. Okay. So what's stability or instability? That's the concept we want to uh, talk about today. All right. So instability is basically when you have a structure, right? You're not overloaded by stress. So the stress is OK, right? For example, if this one, you keep increasing, you generate crack. And that's normal failure we talk about, overstressing. OK. But the structure, for example, like this bottle, right? If I just press on, and then this will not be able to hold any uh, water, like a Coke can. When you step on it, it will just crash it. But if you look at the, the wall, actually, it's still intact. There's no leak there. So, but the structure, as a structure, a container, it failed to be able to function. And that's the type of a, a general concept of buckling or instability. Okay. So a simple model is a column. Okay. So before we go down, let's actually define uh, what is stability or instability. Okay. So here are a couple of just, uh, just showing the examples. When you step on a coke can or the metal uh, rail can during the summer because the thermal, the, uh, some are too hot, so metal try to expand, and there are limited space. So when they try to expand, they just buckle. Another one, a typical example is water hose. When you squeeze it, right, you just collapse. So the water cannot go through. That's another example of instability, or we call it buckling concept as well. Okay. 
So what's the stabi stability? Okay. Uh, what's the stable? Okay. So when we talk about a system, right, a system, we often say this word. Uh, this thing is stable, or this thing is unstable. Okay. So me, there can be many uh, different meaning, right? For for example, for sale or for living stuff, it stay that way. We call it stable. If it's a change, right, we say it's unstable, right? Or you are, if you stand there, that's it can be stable or not stable, right? Or mentally, I'm rest stable right now, or it can be unstable. So that's a spiritual uh, concept of stable and unstable. Here we talk about mechanical. So mechanical, if you have a system, okay, the, that the system is in equilibrium, okay. If the equilibrium is something that can go against interference. A disturbance, and we say it's stable. For example, uh, on the left here, you have this ball within this uh, concave uh, shape here, right? Imagine if the wind blew, or you just touch it, you move move it aside, and then over time, you just back, back, right, back and forth. Eventually, it will stop in the middle, back to the initial position, and we call this one a stable equilibrium. So mechanically, we say this system is stable. Because it can always recover if there is a disturbance or perturbation, uh, right? If you just uh, disturb it, it will recover back to where it used to be, and that's stable. Okay. In contrast, if you look at the one in the middle, okay, the ball is there. It's stable. It's equilibrium, right? You can maintain this equilibrium, okay? But the, imagine if there is a wind blow over, or you just touch it, and then it will just go away. It will never come back by itself. So we say this equilibrium or this system is unstable because it cannot recover. Right? And then on the very far right, this is a system. If you move the ball somewhere and then just say that a new place will maintain or remain as equilibrium condition. Right? And that we call neutral equilibrium, or it's neutral in terms of stability. So it can be anywhere, it will be stable. So the key uh, saying we use is often stable or unstable. Right. So for lots of system, this thing exists. Right. This kind of concept exists there. So you can be, let's say, a bridge. Right. If you push the bridge a little bit, it right, like a wind blew over, and then you are deformed to one side. But when the wind is gone, right, the bridge can kind of bounce back, and then eventually, with a few bounces or maybe many bounces back and forth. And then eventually it will recover to the original position. So we say that bridge is stable. Right? In contrast, if the wind blew over and then the whole thing just go over too much, it cannot go back, formally deform, or just crash, and so the bridge is not stable. So that's the concept of stable or unstable. Okay. So same thing for many structures occur. Like this, see here, this is unstable because when I crash it, so it's not coming back. Right? So that's basically unstable structure. You see, now it's stay this way. Right? You have to apply force, say, put some air pressure there, then it will recover. recover. We talk about whether it can recover by cell. Right? So this one, not able to recover by cell, therefore it's unstable. All right. OK, so um, in, the, in a sense, any structure, many structures, you have, can have this issue, whether it's stable or unstable. Okay, so it's stability can be a more very complicated uh, problem mathematically, then, right? So uh, it's very challenging to determine the stability of a, a complicated system. So we we'll start with something very simple, just a column. So basically a bar. Okay, let's say we have a bar, right? If you pull it on it, I think I have a slide next. Yeah. So if you pull on this bar, right? Exultation. Is this stable or unstable? It's stable. Because let's say, imagine someone disturb it a little bit, right? And then you pull in there, so it will recover right away. So therefore, this is stable uh, condition for bar and the actual tension. However, if you change the direction of the force, make a compression, OK? Now this system, this bar, can become unstable. Because let's say if you touch this, somehow, when the blue sideways, and then the ball in the middle there, it just lost stability. So this thing just pop up, and you cannot recover by itself because the force keep pushing, right? Once it's pop up, then you force pushing, it will just 
go crazy, like a total failure, right? Or just deform totally. So therefore, this will be unstable. Okay. So that give us an idea or concept that if you have a bar, right? If it's under actual tension, you're always stable. But if under actual compression, it can be unstable. So we need to find out at what condition when you're applying actual compression, it's unstable. And at what load, it will become unstable. The critical load, what we call it. So we need to find out how much load you can apply to a column as actual compression without failure, or that critical point, the tipping point. What's the load you can apply? That's the task we're going to uh, finish today. All right. Okay. Now let's look at the column as shown here. Okay. How can we find out how much load you can apply here? We start with a very simple case. All right. Make it easy so you have a simple, what we call simple column. So you have a pin support on one end and pin support on that end. So they're free to rotate, but not free to move away. Right. So their uh, rotation is OK, but the translation is prohibited. OK. Now for this column, how can we find out how much load you can apply here without this uh, instability occur? Or remain stable. Can we use something like an equation of equilibrium? Right. Okay. Let's say we want to use the equation of equilibrium. Okay. So you can draw the equation free body diagram, right? So when you're applying force P here, then what you're going to have will be a reaction here. Let's call this one R. Now, what's the equation of equilibrium for this system? So you're going to have sigma Fy equals 0, right? So you're, you have P minus R equals 0. That will give you R equals P. In other words, how much you compress from the top, then how much reaction you're going to have here, right? Then imagine you are increasing P value load from 0. You keep increasing, increasing, but always this R will keep increasing, right? So you're always in equilibrium. The reaction always cancels out the action, P. So it will be always true that the P equals R. But this cannot tell you at what load this thing will buckle. Now, how will this column buckle? First, let's get the concept. OK, so here is a column, right? If I pull on it, you see it's kept straight. Now, if I compress on it, OK, so keep compress it. You see what happens? This thing bend to the side. OK, so this phenomenon shows, OK, a column when you compress on it, it will what we call buckle. OK, how it buckle? It basically just bend over to the side. Right? It's like a bending. You are you applying movement, so it will bend. It's a similar. You compress applying force, and then it will just bend. So the deformation is somehow like a bending. But the reason is not because of lateral load, it's because you apply actual force. You can bend. Now, so this gives you a concept. If you apply actual force, the thing can actually bend as well. Okay. Now, what we need is find out this actual force. How much we can apply here actually, this beam going to bend, deform into this shape. If we can find that, then we know, okay, at this load, it becomes unstable. So that's the general idea how to find this force. Okay. So to summary, or in other words, what we can do is actually, let's assume, okay, we're applying this force, it bent. Now let's see how much force you apply here, this bent, as here you apply force, okay, this can retain or maintain as an equilibrium condition. And that's how we can find out this force. Because by this equation of equilibrium here, we can never find it, because this is always true, P equals R, R equals P. Right? It never tell you at what p value it will buckle. So the way we can find it is let's assume it happens. Then we find out oh how much load you're holding, it, and that give me the critical load. Okay, everyone follow this logic. Okay, once you follow this, the next will be easy. Will be just mathematical derivations. All right. So the okay, let's say we assume this buckle will occur. So when buckle occur 
And then this beam, let's just make it easier, just draw a single line that's representing the beam. So the beam will bend from a straight line to a curved line. <laughs> okay, so next, can we find out how much load you have to apply here to be able to maintain this buckle the shape, curve the shape as in equilibrium? And this we call the method we are doing is actually called a genset equilibrium approach. Equilibrium. Right. So basically, when the bar is straight, that's the equilibrium, right? When you apply load, there is always an equilibrium. Now we want to find the load that you can reach a second equilibrium at this buckled condition. Because this is close to this one, so we call a adjacent equilibrium. All right, now, can we find out if the beam is buckled or is curved, how much load we need there to maintain this equilibrium? Remember, we want to make sure the load can maintain equilibrium in this new load, a new deformed condition. Right. Okay, how can we find this load? What's the approach we'll be using to find out the load? Free body diagram, right? And then you write the equation of equilibrium. It's the same thing. That's the only two we have. We don't have other super two that can give us the value, right? So we have to use the same two. Now, free body diagram, okay. How can we find out, write the equilibrium and get it? We need a free body diagram to get, to be able to, for us to write out the equations, okay. Now, how do you select your free body to draw the free body diagram? That becomes the key. You can select the whole system, for example, right? Let's say we select the whole thing as a free body. Now, you have the action here, then you're going to have a reaction here, R, right? Now, if you write the equation of equilibrium about this system, what do you get? You got sigma fy equals zero. So P minus R equals zero, R equals P. So that won't give you anything about what the P value should be, right? So therefore, this won't give you the result, the answer you want. So how can you find out? Okay, deformation, yes, that's a good point. So can we somehow find the deformation? Okay, this deformation is like a bending, right? It goes sideways. So we still call it deflection. Right? So this, okay, so we use the same letter V. Now, how can we find a deflection? V. Remember, we don't, we will, most likely we cannot directly find out the V because we don't know the load. We, we, the question was how much load you can apply in there. But we think, oh, if I can find the deflection, then maybe I can use that to find the load. But the deflection, I don't know. So we have two unknowns. The load is unknown, the deflection is unknown. Okay. Any other suggestions? How can we be able to find out this deflection? Okay, in the beams, how do we find out deflection? <coughs> moment, yes, that's the key word, moment. If we can somehow find out the moment in this bar, then maybe there are a way we can find deflection. And the moment must link to this load, P. That sounds reasonable? Yeah, because we know the moment equation. So EI, let's say EI V2 prime equals the moment. So if we can somehow find a moment in this column, we don't call it beam now, we call it column. Then we can basically maybe find out the V. Now, can we find a moment in this column somewhere, anywhere? Let's say I go from here, let's say this is the X direction, right? So this is a zero. So as any x location here, for example, can we find the moment here, the moment m at this location x? Now, how can we find the moment inside a column or a beam? What did you use back then in chapter four? VM diagram, remember, we find the V in the M. Now, how can we find the M here? What I need a moment at the location x. 
How can we find the moment at the location x? I'm changing the question now. What's the approach we use back then? Find the moment. Okay, let's say I have a beam, right? This is a beam. Okay, let's say it's beam this same thing. I have a load here. How can I find the moment here? You cut it. Yes, cut it. We can cut it here, right? I want to find the moment here, so I cut here. Then I draw all this load, their internal action moment, and then I write the equation of equilibrium. So that sounds a logical approach, right? Okay, now let's cut it here. Okay, if you cut it, I think I have it in the next slide. It's here. Okay, so let's say we cut it here at the location in X. Well, this figure somehow it turned to the right. Does it matter? Left or right? It should not matter, right? Because spatially, if you stand here, that's to the left. If I stand this way, it will be to the right. Right? Spatially, it doesn't matter. Okay, so anyway, we cut the location X. Now, if I cut here at this cross section here, Okay. What kind of load do I have on this surface? If the beam, the whole beam is drawn here, you have a load P here. It's like, okay, here is a load. What's happening here at the location X on this cross section? What kind of load do you have on this surface? You should have a, maybe a shear force V Right? And also this actual load P. Is that correct? Because you're going to have a reaction R here equals P. So balance there must be P. Or in other words, this P here, applied here, equal to a P here plus a moment. Right? Remember when you have an object here, you're applying force P here. Then to this point, you basically equal to you have a P plus a moment. That's when you translate a force, right? So on this surface, we're going to have P and M. Now, what's the V value? There may be a V, right? Someone suggests there may be a V. Now, what's the V value? Can we find the V value? Must be zero. Why does it need to be zero? Because sigma fx equals zero, right? For this system, for this half beam system and for this whole beam system, sigma fx all need to be zero. Yeah, so in the y direction, any force there? No. So based on equilibrium, the v must be zero. That's why in the original figure, it doesn't show any v there. Well, you must, because the, for the whole system, if you look at this figure here, you must have an r here, right? So because you have r here, therefore, the same R will be here, because I'm just cutting half. Look at this half or this portion. So there must be a reaction R equals P. Right? So for the whole system, you should have by free body diagram. Okay, the original figure was not complete. So what I have added here, the red reaction. So now it's a complete free body diagram. Why don't we have a reaction in the horizontal? Okay, why do we have any reaction in the horizontal direction? Because sigma fx must be zero. There's no load in the x direction. See, if you look at the top, there are only load in the y direction. I mean, in the x direction. We call this x. Right? There's no load in the y direction. Or no load in the horizontal direction. So all the reaction must be zero. All right? OK, anyone follow this? Uh, what's the load at this surface here, at this location x? So basically, you just have a XO force. Not that we call don't call XO. Maybe just uh, in the X direction. There are force P in the X direction, and plus a moment. Okay. Once we realize that, now next, can we find out this M here? What's the value of this moment M here? This M X. Any suggestion here? How do you find it? How? Sorry, that's a, how do you find it? Equation of equilibrium, right? How do you find the reaction forces, right? Equation of equilibrium. That's why we draw the free body here. Okay, write the equation of equilibrium. What's the M then?
equation of equilibrium about this free body diagram, about this free body, should be sigma m equals zero to anywhere. Select one point. Can we select point A? Okay, for this system, all the movement to point A and together should be zero. Now, can we write that equation? Okay, what do you have to point A? You have a moment m this way. So you have a negative m. Then the p will generate a moment this way. Okay, how much does the p generate? Should it be p times the v, the v we're looking for, right? Okay, we don't know yet, but it's a v. All right, so we have this equation. Sigma all the moment to point A equals zero. So we have m equals p times v. There's no reaction movement where? Point A? Okay, what's the restriction at point A? It's a pin support. What's a pin support? Free rotate, right? Cannot move anywhere. It's like here, this one. You can free rotate, but not going anywhere. That's why there's no movements, react, no reaction movement at point A. Later on, we'll talk about if you fix this end, then you're going to have a movement. But that's another case we're going to talk later on. For this simple one, we call simple column. It's just simple pin pin support. It's simple. That's why we start with this one. And why we call it simple column. Right? All right. So that's the equation. You all agree this is the equation. Why there is negative sign? Because if you look at this column here, it's basically a beam. You're bending this way, right? So the bending moment, if you look at it this way, okay, you stand here, turn your head a little bit. Now the Y is this way. So the moment is bending this way. That's a positive moment or negative moment? Positive, it's bending upward. So moment is supposed to be positive. Now, what's the deflection V there? It's negative, right? It's going in the negative direction. How do you, why is this way? That's why you have a negative sign there. So when V is negative, the moment should be positive. Okay, now, once we have here, this movement right out, everything else is just now mathematical. Okay, so next thing you can do is you have this equation, right? That's a standard uh, bending equation, how we determine the deflection. Now, can we combine these two equations together? Yes, put the PV into here, that's what you get. Is that correct? Basically, you just change the M. So that's a PV, and that's what you get. Now, what kind of equation we got? What do we call it? You all took it like a EA1, EA2, right? What do we call this equation? Second order normal differential equation, right? And it's linear. And it's called homogeneous. Why is homogeneous? Because equals zero there, right? So it's a homogeneous second order linear differential equation. Now, can we solve this equation? Yes, we learned that scale. Okay, so next will be easy. We just solve this mathematical equation. Okay, so here is the summary. It's second order homogeneous linear differential equation. So I'll just repeat what I just said. Okay, now how can we solve it? How do you solve a differential equation like this? Oh, anyone remember the solution for this equation? Anyone remember the solution? We can simplify it a little bit. Okay, so here's the simplification. So we can let k squared equals to this, p over ei. And then the equation will change it to this way. Okay, does this look even familiar? Yes, what's the solution for this one? Something like uh, sine cosine, right? Yes, right? Okay, so we can solve it, or you can just call back your memory and put it here. Okay, let's see what I have here. And I just gave the solution. Now, how do I get this solution? Anyone remember the process? Okay, I can actually go back right here. I think I have a space here. So we have this V2 prime plus K squared, V equals zero. Okay, 
How do you solve this differential equation? You let V equals to, you remember, E I X, right? The, your variable is X, location. It's not time T, right? So you put this one in, and then to find the solution. And you'll find it will be, because I X is the cosine sine X. So you will find this solution here. So if you're not sure, oh, how do you get it? We can do it the other way. Can we plug this V back to the equation, see if it fits? Right? That's another way you can verify a solution. So you plug this one in. OK. What's the V2 prime? It will be sine become sine itself, but with a negative sign. Right? Sine, derivative, cosine, cosine, then negative sine. OK, now for cosine, it will be become sine. A negative sign, and then you do again, so it will be negative cosine. So everything changes the sign, but it remains <laughs> the same, sign or cosine. So you can say this will fit that equation perfect. So we know this is the solution. Okay. So is that convinced enough? This is the solution? All right. If this is a general solution, okay, remember now I say the word, it's just a general solution. Now we need to figure out what's the C, what's the K, right? Then it will become the actual solution we're looking for. Now, can we find the C in the K? Yeah, boundary conditions. Yeah, solving differential equation. I always say boundary conditions, right? OK, boundary condition. What kind of boundary do we have here? Ping, ping. OK, what's ping mean? Point A. Deflection equals to 0. OK, so we have here deflection equals 0 at mm -hmm. x equals 0. OK, what's the other boundary condition? When x equals L, the other end, deflection also equals 0. OK, so if you put the first one, OK, let's look at the first one. V equals 0. x must be 0. So when this is 0, this is 0. So cosine 0, C2 plus C1 sine 0 must be equal to 0. Right? OK, now what's C2? Must be zero because cosine zero, that's one. One times C2 must be zero. So therefore C2 must be zero. So immediately we know, okay, this term is gone. So you have only one term. So C1. Now what's C1? Then we use a V equal zero at X equals L. Now plug it in, so this must be zero. Now what's the solution then? See what's C1? C1 must be zero. But if C1 is equal to 0, what happens? Your equation, C1, C2 there, everything is 0. So 0. So 0 is a solution. Yes, it's a solution. You can put the 0 there, it will fit the equation. But what do we call it? What kind of solution we call it mathematically? Triple, Triple solution. That's not what we're looking for. The non-zero solution is what we're looking for. OK, how can C1 be not 0 and this equation still be true? The sine KL must be 0, right? OK, how can sine KL equal 0? KL, KL must be zero either 0 or pi, or 3 pi, or 5 pi, or 4 pi, right? Any n pi will be fine. OK, so that's a solution. I think we have it here. So sine KL 0, the KL must be n pi. OK, then you keep going. Then the, because what's K? Remember, K squared equals to P over EI, right? So put it in, you'll get this solution. So now we have a solution. P must be equal to that if you want a non-zero solution. What's a non-zero solution? That means bending over, right? And that means buckling. So therefore, if P reaches this level, then you're going to have a buckling. The thing going to deform, this column going to deform into a, what kind of shape? sine wave or half sine wave, the solution will be like given here. That's only when the P equals to this. And then right, you get this solution. When P equals this, then you find the K. So you put the K there, this one, you put the K there, so you have this solution. This is the, actually the K part. OK. So we find the solution. And amazingly, 
for this equation, we have two unknowns. P is unknown, V is unknown. But we have only one equation. And with this one equation, we find these two unknowns. Okay. Anyone recognize what kind of equation we have here? The one we just saw here. This equation here. Does that sound a bear? Eigenvalue, right? So this is basically an eigenfunction. So it's an eigenvalue problem. So one equation, you can find the eigenvalue and the eigenvector. So the p value is the eigenvalue, or the k is the eigenvalue. And this v is your eigenvector. In this case, it's eigenfunction. So that's why you can solve for two unknowns, it's one equation because it's an eigenvalue problem. It's an eigenvalue differential equation. All right. So anyway, we find the solution. Now, if I you ask if you ask me, okay, how much load I can apply to this column, right? To reach a buckling. Then I say, okay, this much load you should be applying. Now, what about n? What's the n value I should use? Should I use one? I cannot use zero, right? Because zero that's a zero load. That's the triple solution. Okay, n equals one, two, three, four, or five. Which one can I use? N equals one. Why n equals one? What's wrong with multiple waves? Maybe you're packing into multiple waves. Why n equals one should be your solution for engineering practice? Well, n equals two can break too, right? You show here n equals two. It just break into different shape. N equals one, you will buckle into this shape. N equals two, you maybe buckle into this shape. But there's a solution. Why we pick n equals one? Okay, imagine you have a structure. You start applying load. You start from zero, right? You increase and increase. Now, oh, you reach uh, the first value, n equals one. Now, can you keep going to reach n equals two? No, because at n equals one, it's already buckled, and this thing will fail. So physically, you can only reach n equals one. n equals one is the smallest value you can go there, the lowest one of all the solutions. So mathematically, they're all solutions. But practically, when you're applying load to structure, once it reaches the first mode, the n equals one, it will buckle. So you will never actually go to n equals two. So it's a solution exists mathematically, but not physically. Right. Especially in this case. In general case, if you have the n equals high mode actually exists. For example, when you have a beam embedded in a surrounding mud or surrounding uh, support tissue, okay? Like the blood vessels in the body is surrounded by tissue. Then when it bends, it actually generates multiple waves. So n equals two or three or four exist, exist. But for this ideal situation, there's no support surrounding the solution. The minimum solution will be n equals one. So for this reason, we're going to have uh, this equation for we call for critical load, a critical load. Okay, so when we ask you for critical load for engineering structures or for a column, and we're going to use n equals one. So this is the smallest value you can reach without buckle. Or this will be the first load, critical load you reach the system will buckle. All right. Okay, now can we answer the question we asked at the beginning? If I have this column as shown here, right? Applying load P, it may buckle. So can I find out how much load I can apply into this column before it buckle or when it buckles? Yes, I just use this equation. So I don't have to go through this whole process again. I can just use this one equation, plug in the equation, and find the solution. So this will be on your formula sheet, right? That's a formula. OK, and then you need to understand, OK, what's in this formula? OK, what's the pi square? You know. Everyone know what's pi, pi value, right? Okay, what's the E? It's a modulus of the material. Okay, now what's the I? It's a bending moment initia, right? Or the moment initia to the x axis. 
that come from the EAI V2 prime equals M from the bending equation. That's why it's the same moment initial we use in beam chapter. All right, now what's the L? Length of the beam. Okay. So once we know this dimensions, then we can calculate how much load you can carry. So for any material, any column, as long as you know all this, so you can figure out how much load you can find it when you reach buckle. Okay. So imagine you have a very long beam. Okay, the beam area is very big. Okay, then what happens here? If the L is really big, so your P value will be very small. Right? So right? when L increase, it's inversely proportional to the L squared. So when you have a bar, okay, L, you double the L, then your load will, if you double the length, what happened to the critical load? It will be four times less. So if you have a really long bar, it's really easy to buckle, right? If you have a very short bar, it's hard to buckle. So when you have a short bar, like this part, if you press on, you may have to keep increase the load to generate crack before it buckles. But if you have a long bar, you just apply a little bit of load, it will buckle. There won't be any crack there, because the load, if you look at locally, the force divided by the area, it will be very small value. So buckling can occur to a long bar. That's why we have a long column of buckling. Okay. All right. So for the same reason, right? I can easily press on this one, it will buckle. So this shortest segment, I don't know if anyone is strong enough, press this part, make it buckle. Anyone want to try it? Just make this part buckle just by compressing it. It's really hard because the load will be, say this one is one fourth of this length. So this will be 16 times high load than compared to this one, right? So you need to be 16 times stronger than me to be able to buckle this part. Right? So that's why you want, whenever possible, one stable structure, use short columns. They will be stable, right? You can carry more load. Okay, now for some design, you want holding a, br a bridge or building up, you have to use the long column. Now, how can you make it stable, more stable? You can increase the E, right? Or increase the I. How do you increase the I? You design, make it bigger, right? It will be more stable. I mean, the cross the dimensions, bigger. The B, the edge, or the diameter, bigger, it will be more stable. So cylinder bars are easy to buckle, right? OK, any other way you can make the beams more stable? Let's say I have this one. How can I make this a little bit stable than what I have here? Change the support. You can fix this part, for example, right? This will be a little bit more stable. OK, so next time we're going to talk about if you change this boundary condition, instead of pin support, if you make a fixed end, what's the buckling load you can hold there? So you can have different, let's say I'm holding both ends, make both ends fixed. Then it's really, you can carry a lot of weight there. Right? So the boundary condition can affect the load as well. So we've been talking about for different boundary conditions, what this equation will look like. But the concept is all like this. It's the same thing. OK, so we have a few minutes. Let's Go over one ex quick example, uh, see if we can find out the solution. Okay, let's say I have a beam here, right? And I have this, another bar here, support it. Okay, we see this, this let's say this part is uh, pin. Okay, so I want to carry a load here. Okay, now I want to find out, okay. How much load I can carry here? Remain, make the structure remain stable before buckling. Or in other words, at what load is a rich buckling? It will become unstable. Okay, how can I find how much load I can apply here? If I know all the dimensions, right? I know this beam, what's the EI? Okay, what's the EI? 
And I know the length. Let's say make it easier. This length will be L. This length also L. You can give a value if you want, right? OK, how can we find out how much load P I can apply here? Uh, see your suggestion again? Um, let's say zero. What's zero? The, uh, deformation. the deformation. OK, how does this system deform, or how does where the buckling would occur. When you apply load here, what happens? This beam going to bend a little bit, right? But it won't buckle. It will just bend. Now, what about this beam here? That's a column, right? If you draw the free body diagram for this part, just for this beam, vertical beam or the column, this is what you get. So you're going to have a reaction R here, right? Because you are compressing this part, you're applying load. So for this column, you go to under reaction R. Now, under R, if the R is big enough, then what happens to the column? If the R, if you keep increasing the R, what's going to happen? It will buckle, right? So therefore, can I find out how much R I can apply here? Yes, so the R will be equal to pi square EI over L square, right? Now, so for this column, I can carry this much load. Now, can I find out how much P I can apply here? What's the relation between P and R? How can we find the relation between P and R? Equilibrium, yes. Right? Okay. How do you write the equi equation of equilibrium? Selection the free body diagram. Okay, which one you select? You have to select something, right? Write the equation of equilibrium about that free body. You select the beam. Okay, so I select the beam. So this will be the beam. OK, here I have reaction R. Here I have the pin support. And then here is a load P. Now, here's the reaction. I don't know. This one will call RA, maybe. OK, now, what's the equation of equilibrium? Moment 2.8 equals 0, right? So I have R times moment. That's Half L, then this will be counterclockwise, right? So we call this positive. Then minus P times L equals zero. That's the relation between P and R. Now, if I know R, the critical you can go, the highest you can go is this much. Now, can I find how much the R can go, uh, the P can go? Yeah, from here. So P equals what? Half of the R. So your load can only go half of it. Okay, so we find out P C R will equal to half the R C R, and that will be this equation you divide by two. Okay, so that's a great one. Now, if I want the safety factor of four for this system, how high the P can go? You divide this P value by four times. That's how high it can go. All right. Any questions? OK, um, I just think one thing I want to tell you all is that, uh, you know, ASME here, uh, we have people donate money actually every year, give out a fellowship. Uh, there are not many people applying sometimes. So if you got to, you know, uh, see the notice, try to apply, you can get a $1,000 or 1500 uh, award. For you, you study here. Actually, we have a winner from this year. Uh, Chelsea, she got this year's ASME fellowship. So I hope more people are applying later. Right. Yeah. Yes. Is it only for Americans? 
Uh, no, you don't have to be American citizen. You just uh, be anyone you study in uh, mechanical engineering. Uh, Chelsea, you can tell us, right? That's a, what's the qualification? See you next time. Thank you. I had a question about the, uh, the test, actually. Mm -hmm. um, number one, 